Are we ready to get started? Sorry for all of the uh, <laughs> the slow start here. So um, we're going to talk about how to contribute to Docs at Microsoft. Uh, show you the, uh, the the methods we use, the tools we use, and so on, and how you can help us out. Uh, my name is Sean Wheeler. I'm the lead content owner for um, the PowerShell doc set itself, and I have with me Mike. And uh, you you may remember him more like this from years <laughs> past. So. <laughs> And um, these slides are available on the Summit uh, GitHub, Summit Materials GitHub. We've got our um, uh, GitHub aliases and our email up there. You can contact us. Actually, um, we'll have an update with our Twitter handles on here as well. Oh, uh, yeah, he's got the <laughs> updated version we, we made the edits to. Um, One point for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talking about why you should contribute. Um, this Contributing to Docs is a much easier way uh, to contribute back to PowerShell without having to get into the, the weeds of the code. If the, if the C-sharp scares you, <laughs> like it does me, this is a much easier way to do it. Uh, and it helps improve the documentation for everyone. Um, and again, this is a great way to get recognition from the community. There's some things I'll show you about what, how we recognize the community. Um, and if you're new to GitHub and Markdown, this is a great way to learn that as well. Um, so this is going to be demo heavy. We've got a few slides we're going to show. Uh, mostly uh, the slides will be here so you have easy access to these links. Um, let me. I'm just going back to the GitHub and the Markdown stuff. So it's really skills you need for other things. So like me, when I was at my company, I was the only one contributing to a, the GitHub repo. So it's like, how do I work with a team? Well, to learn those skills, you can contribute to docs, which is kind of a low, a lot lower learning curve. And then if you wanna, even if you're blogging, if you're posting, say, on GitHub pages or Hugo or Jekyll, you're gonna use the same workflow for your stuff. And like me at my previous job, I didn't have uh, somebody to, to look at my code, like a code reviewer. So it'll give you, uh, I blog for free code reviews. Hey, just post your stuff on Reddit. But anyway, this will give you a chance to have somebody with your markdown and, and so on and your writing skills to kind of to kind of take a look and say, hey, you know, do it this way instead of this other way. And these are the reasons. Yeah, and so the process we're going to show you, um, we have all this documented out on uh, docs.microsoft.com. This is the public contributor guide. And everything we're going to show you here is how to contribute to anything on docs.microsoft.com, not just PowerShell. We're going to talk to you about some of the specific things for PowerShell as we go through this. But uh, this walks you through how to get set up um, with the tools. If you don't have a GitHub account already, f first of all, I think most everybody, who uses GitHub? Okay. So we, we probably don't have to spend a lot of time explaining that. Um, and we certainly recommend doing the full workflow, which is uh, going to be part of our demo. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also have out here um, these writing essentials guides where there's the reference to Markdown. And we have some uh, specific things in our publishing platform, some Markdown extensions uh, like these alerts. So there's some special markup that we use in docs like this that create these alert boxes. So this is non-standard markdown, but we have it documented here. Um, so this is a good reference uh, on the markdown we use. And then there's information here about style and voice and writing principles and um, a, a good way to get started. Yeah, if you're like me and before I joined Microsoft and started writing docs for them, 
you look at their Gecko Burrito and it's like, what's that crap? You know, it's not Markdown. <laughs> but it's some uh, stuff on top of Markdown that renders in their engine. So if you look at it in Markdown, it doesn't render properly. And then we, uh, we use relative lengths a lot of times because that allows our docs to work in like an air gap uh, environment. So if you go to GitHub, a lot of the links are open. It's like, hey, what's the deal, guys? But they render properly on, on our, our platform. platform. Yeah. And because um, for like government clouds, the air gapped environments, we publish those docs in there. And if we were linking to docs.microsoft.com uh, directly, the air gap clouds wouldn't be able to get there. With relative links, they get published in a way that'll work for the air gap clouds. Um, and then we have in the PowerShell doc set, we have uh, another contributor's guide here that gives you the specifics for PowerShell. And we'll look at this in a little more detail uh, as we go through. Uh, so let me see where one we are. I will say, so we've got some conflicting information. You'll look at the first one that Sean showed, and it'll say do something a certain way, maybe uh, to do italics, I think was the example we looked at mm -hmm. yesterday. And their docs, they do it one way, and our doc, our contribution guide says do it another. Well, of course, we always win. <laughs> So, uh, so if, we, if there's anything conflicting, use the contribution guide that's closest to that documentation. Right. It's just like any open source project, follow the style of that project um, for any contributions you make. And um, like in Markdown, right, there's how many different ways can you do bullets? How many different ways can you do italics? Uh, you can use the asterisks or the, the underscores. We've decided asterisks is bold and underscores is italics. And that shows us the author's intent of what the, the markup they, in, they meant to use. Uh, there's no mistakes, so. Um, and of course, there's always exceptions to that rule. So we've, you can use, of course, tildes, which we don't use. We use backticks for like the- The code, code blocks. blocks. But, if you want to show somebody how to write it and you're going to put the back ticks inside there so they can actually see it, then you would need to use the tildes on the outside. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so before we get into making a simple change, let's talk about um, the docs. How many people go use docs on a regular basis? Um, some things you might have noticed, there were some recent changes made. Um, they moved these links here, and uh, they've changed the right-hand navigation. So if you go into a larger article, um, you'll see this is expandable now. They, they don't show the whole navigation. Um, this is something they're testing out. Um, we've had some feedback that people don't necessarily like this. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to give feedbacks to the Docs platform folks about that. Um, I'm one of them. I don't. I don't care for this See, myself. I personally like it because if I want to know something about installing on a previous version that was linked there, it's kind of an outline of the chapter. I can click on that link and bam, I'm in that section. Yeah, but uh, so one of the there's a couple changes they made. They they collapse it so you don't see the whole thing and. It's no longer pinned to the top of the screen, so it scrolls off the page and you have to go back. Um, but just realize right now this is uh, like a 30-day trial and they're gonna get feedback and there'll be more changes coming. Um, some other stuff I wanna make sure people understand about our docs. So we have uh, two levels of navigation here. The top level here is um, the docs site itself so you want to um, go to some other major doc set, uh, you can start back at the root of docs and drill down from there. Uh, we have this level two navigation that's all PowerShell. Um, and then the doc set itself with the table of contents. We have this um, version picker here, and this switches between the documentation for the version of PowerShell that you're working on. Uh, we get a lot of issues that get filed with us that says, well, this parameter doesn't exist on this command or whatever. And they're looking at the documentation for 7.2, uh, 
but they're using 5.1. Um, so uh, always be sure you're, you're selecting the correct version there. Um, what the version does also, if you see the URL, if you can see it at the top, it's got 7.2 on the end, that's the version monitor, so it kind of tweaks the end of the URL. But my recommendation, even if you're writing a blog article and linking to it, is don't put the URL on that you specifically need it. And you'll always, or the version, the version monitor, you'll always get the latest version if you don't put a version on it. Yep. That way, if a version goes away, a lot of times, usually we redirect those when you get a nasty message at the top. The other thing I would recommend is we translate our content in different cultures. So if you take the ENUS out, and if somebody's in another country, they'll get their local language. Yep. Does that handle on the back end just about branches or something? How do you, how do you handle all those different versions? Uh, well, yeah, a good question. Um, uh, we'll show you in the repo how this is structured. Um, and it's just folders. <laughs> um, uh, more about here. Um, so also the, th the thing to realize, you see, you can barely see it in the light of this room, but there's a, a line here between uh, reference and the rest of the um, table of contents. Um, so everything above the line is we call conceptual content. And that does not, in, in this doc set, that does not change when you change the version moniker. Um, everything below the line is commandlet reference. So if I expand this out, you'll see all the modules and then you can drill in and see uh, the commandlets. This is what changes when you change the version selection. And at least in my doc set, they all change per version. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's not a sophisticated system. If, if we had version conceptual content, we'd have to duplicate it for every version. So obviously we don't want to have to maintain all of that for all of that conceptual content. Um, also, the other thing to note that uh, everything below the line here is we call auto-generated. We have tooling that helps us create the markdown and publish the markdown, and it builds this part of the... Uh, table of contents, everything above the line, we have to handcraft that table of contents. Um, now, so uh, there's, there's several ways to make a contribution. If you, uh, at the top of every article, there's this um, edit icon, the pencil. You click on that, and that will take you to GitHub for that article. And you can click the edit button here and submit your changes um, that you're interested in. Or you can go to the issues and file an issue. And if you haven't forked this repo, when you click on that edit, it actually forks the repo and creates a branch for you. Because the other day I was on a repo that I hadn't previously forked. And I noticed on my GitHub profile it said I, I uh, created a repository. I'm like, what? I didn't create a repository. <laughs> Yeah, it does it, and it's seamless. So for a simple change, I even saw one of the PMs this week doing his changes this way because it's like a one-line change. Um, in our issues, it's always a good idea if um, you see an issue um, to come check uh, to see if the issue's been filed already. And um, for the PowerShell Docs repo, I have several... Um, I should zoom this up a little bit. Um, issue templates that help you, uh, help you fill out and provide the information we need. So, so choose the most appropriate one here. That's one point for Sean because that's on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is using the new YAML um, issue templates, so uh, they're a lot easier to fill out. And there's required information here. So if you, if you haven't provided the required information, you can't submit. The great thing about that, you don't have to put the X in the stupid little box and then backspace so there's not a space, otherwise it breaks it. So this is really slick. And even on your own repos for your personal projects, that's a great idea. Uh, let's see where we are. Um, so I think we've covered that. Oh yeah, and then for the PowerShell docs, um, we publish uh, 
any changes that have been made during the day get pushed to our live branch, which publishes it to the website um, at 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, so if you've submitted a change and we've merged it, you just need to wait until it goes live to see it on the website. Um, there was something else I was going to... We'll go ahead. So for, the, uh, for the Azure PowerShell doc structure, we, uh, we actually have a couple of repositories. The, and I've recently actually added the button at the bottom of the uh, pages so that you can submit an issue on the reference documentation. And just to be clear, if you're not sure what reference documentation is, that's the command like help. So for all the, all the stuff you would run get help, that's considered reference documentation. And conceptual documentation is more like quick starts and tutorials and that sort of stuff. Um, but the source code for the Azure PowerShell content res resides in the same repo as the source code. And what happens every time we release a new update, which is generally on the first Tuesday of the month, they, uh, they create a, uh, a build and they actually push that over to the docs repo. Uh, and what that means is, so currently I think we released 7.50 this week. So if you, if you actually went out and submitted a contribution on 7.5.0, hey, it would go live. We, we publish twice a day every, in the mornings and afternoons every day. And it would be fine. And then when we publish 7.60 next month, the bug you fixed would be back. And you'd be like, what's the deal? Well, the problem is you have to update the one that's the source version in order to control future versions of the documentation. So you've basically got current versions, kind of like he was showing you in the, yep. in the uh, version moniker. So you could potentially have to update, like currently we have 660, we have 740 and 750 documentation. And then you have the source version. So the Azure stuff is a lot more complicated. And if you do want to make a contribution, feel free to ping me. And uh, we can actually do a Teams meeting or something, and I can show you the specifics. But anyway, there's multiple versions, and we're going to be demonstrating Beyond Compare, which is an easy way to get your docs updated. Yeah, and um, the other thing about his content here, the edit button will take you to the right version. So here I'm on um, a conceptual document, the stuff above the line. And when you go there, you end up in the docs repo not the source code repo. But if we go um, down here to reference and just pick something and click on the edit button. And when he says edit, I want you to notice at the top of the file down at the bottom, the bottom of the screen, there's actually a little bit of metadata at the very top of the file that oh. points it to the right repo. Right. So if you're ever curious about where this resides, you can look at that doc in the metadata and find out. Um, and whenever Sean goes back, I, one thing I want to make sure that we do show that we haven't planned is if you scroll all the way to the bottom of this, show them the two buttons on how to submit it. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, there's my button. Um, well, I have it turned on in mine. Um, so at the bottom of every page, there'll be uh, two buttons here. There's feedback for the product. And so if you click uh, the This Product button uh, in my doc set, it goes to the PowerShell source code repo. Uh, and you can file issues there. And then this page, it takes you to the docs repo uh, to, to file an issue there. Uh, when, you, when you do this for um, feedback on this page, it will open a new issue pre-populated with some uh, text that inserts metadata uh, about what article is being commented on. So we know where you came from uh, when you're typing up your issue. So you don't have to worry about, I saw this problem and, and, linked, to, and linked to the article. It's done that for you. So the point I want to make with this is, so this product means, for this example, it would be a problem with PowerShell, with like the, pro the product or the source code. And this page means the documentation. Now, why they don't just say that? Because <laughs> all, we, we all the time have people putting stuff in different in the wrong repo, and there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, we appreciate the feedback, but it just delays it being triaged and getting to the right person to work on. 
And the difference is, so in my repo, uh, and I have to check the, the document to find out what, why it wasn't on, but it puts you in the right repo because if you say, if you're on a reference documentation, it's going to take you to the source code repo no matter which one you click on. It's just going to pre-populate so you don't have to hand key all the stuff. So um, getting back to your question about how the versions are handled in the, in the source, um, here's the documentation repo for PowerShell. And under the reference folder here is all of the documentation. And then we have a folder for each version that we currently support. And this is where the commandlet reference is. So if I go in here, you'll see there's a folder for each module. And then the commandlets for that module are in each of those folders. And this is duplicated for every version. Um, so it's almost like a four-man source control that everybody uses where you make a copy of all your stuff. <laughs> right. That's exactly what we've done in our repo. Um, and then under Docs Conceptual, this is all the stuff that's above the line. And, um, and it's just marked down. Now the other thing to, that we'll talk about is the commandlet reference has a very specific format to it that's sort of schematized um, that our tooling relies on to transform it for the web um, and for updatable help. One of the things that Jason and I have been working on for the past year that we, we got done was um, in PowerShell docs, anytime daily when we merge to live, it automatically regenerates the updatable help. So updatable help will have the, the new information, the edits that we made. You just need to run update help dash force um, because the version number doesn't change and that way it forces it to pull it down. Uh, where are we, Mike? Oh, yes, let's, um, so hopefully, <laughs> Everyone's familiar with this process of GitHub. Um, just real quick, the steps I've um, drawn out here in red are your one-time things. You need to fork uh, the, the Microsoft Docs repo to <coughs> your uh, account. You need to clone your fork down to your local machine and create that upstream remote pointer to point back to the uh, Microsoft Docs. Uh, and then the rest of the step is the normal workflow you do for any kind of submission. The first thing you want to do is make sure your local repo is in sync with the upstream. So you pull that down, or Mike, you, what do you do? You do a fetch? Yeah, so what I do, I do a fetch and then I do a merge, but it's the same thing as doing a get pull. Yeah. I just, um, hey, I like to use the predictor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once you've synced that up, then you can create your working branch and um, edit the files uh, that you want to change. You add your commits uh, uh, to your branch, and then you push that working branch up to your fork, and then from your fork in GitHub, you submit a pull request. Yes, Adil? Just real quick, if you are pushing to um, before you make a commit and push, if you've been working on something for a while, make sure you do that fetch and merge before, because there may have been changes since your last okay. Yeah, and if you can, uh, I would recommend rebase. <laughs> and don't be scared of rebase on your own local stuff. Mm -hmm. the, reason, um, the reason we recommend that, especially if you're in Azure Docs in that repo, there's thousands of changes a day. And I made this mistake, I think, the first couple of days I started at Microsoft, I used that workflow. And it made it look like my small change, that my change can, contained everybody else's change since, okay. uh, since I have refreshed because I merged all their stuff in. So, uh, so we do use a rebase. We ran into that doing the conference book, too, with the same reason. Yeah. <laughs> so learn rebase. It's not that scary. <laughs> but ultimately, what that slide does, I mean, you're always working against your uh, fork of the repo. And then when you when you open up your repo, then you submit a pull request from yours to the other one. And you're working off of working, or I call it a feature branch. But even our contribution guides, they call it a working branch. Question. Yes. How much of that flow is actually uh, exposed through the web where you click edit? Um, 
good it, of it a good it yeah it does the if you haven't uh, forked uh, it'll create the fork for you and then in the web you're doing edits in your fork instead of locally but you can only do one file at a time doing the full workflow you could do multiple files to be submitted in a single PR so would you recommend I still recommend this because we're going to show you the problem of versions. Okay. <laughs> I've never used a simple workflow, but it is something in our contribution guides. And if you just want, if you're if you're not familiar with Git and all that, then it's much easier. Okay. okay, so now let's get into our, whoops, yeah, our workflow. So, um, do we want to reverse the roles since I'm on screen? Sure, that'd be great. Um, Does that have a right to your repo to, uh, to, to merge? merge. Oh. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what we have here is we have an issue. Um, I had it open. See, that's the thing about live demos. Yeah. See, I was prepared to do that role, and so now we're role reversed. Um, so somebody filed an issue for us that the wording was confusing for the property type parameter on new item property. It made it sound like you could use the values regsc, reg binary, instead of these values of string, binary, expand string, and so on. And fair feedback, great idea. We need to, uh, it, it's simple minor wording change. So, um, and this, this, you know, they could have actually contributed this, but this one is probably a little more advanced. So if you do have one advanced, feel free to reach out to us. But if you found something in our docs and you're like, hey, I don't want to contribute to that, then if you'll follow an issue, it would be appreciated, you know. What do you mean by reach out to us? Like, uh, we've got our contact information on that first slide, so it's got our email addresses cool. too. So I mean, like, yeah. really reach out to us, you know. Cool. Um, with the exception of actually calling me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so I've got uh, VS Code up here. Um, let's see if I can. And really what we're looking for, you know, as far as contributions to docs, and it's just what I said, we're looking for contributors, you know, contributions. We're not looking for authors. I mean, we're the authors. We're not expecting you to go out and alter the content. But if you have something like, hey, I've got some ideas for this doc, it would be awesome, and it's going to be a major rework, then that's a scenario where I would recommend reaching out to us or at least file an issue to say, hey, I've got this idea and I'd like to do this. Because we had some issues that they, they basically wrote the article in their issue, you know, so it was almost a copy and paste. Uh, I'm going to, well, I'll do it this way. All right, so I'm going to go into my reference folder. I'll just pick a version. Uh, it's, it's in Microsoft PowerShell Management, and we're looking for um, new item property, and we want the, I'll zoom this up a little bit. Let's go full screen. And uh, this is a feature I really like with the markdown. Um, get used to using the outline because um, it works in Markdown as well. So we want to go down to the property type. Um, and this, this helps see the organization of what you're writing. Is, it, is that native now or is yeah. it still an extension? It, yeah, it's native. Um, it, the, the one thing you got to watch out for is make sure you're sorting by position so it appears in the order that you've actually written it. <laughs> um, so it's this content that I want to update. And I, I already had... The solution in a comment in uh, the issue. I'm just going to paste that in. Um, and notice I changed the formatting of this. This is the, the proper formatting for our style guide. We'll show you uh, some of that styling. Uh, but the other thing we do here in our style guide is you notice I have these lines, these rulers. Um, we use this concept of semantic line breaks. Is anybody? Familiar with semantic line breaks? So we don't, we're not blanking on, um, on phrases or uh, you know, semantic concepts as much as columns. So for us, we're using 100 columns. 
And really that makes it easier to read, easier for the next editor to come in and, and see what's going on. It helps when you're on a lower resolution screen to be able to see it better. <coughs> um, and you're just saying it or a lot yeah. better because you don't have this one super long line. Right. Uh, and so here I, I want to break up this, this long line into multiple lines. Well, we have a, um, an extension installed here called Markdown Reflow. Uh, there's a couple of them out there. I recommend this one that we have uh, the, by Marvin. And what it is is uh, I can click here in the, anywhere in this paragraph, this list item, and hit Alt-Q, and it rewraps breaking at my 100 column limit, uh, but it also lines up the indentation properly and doesn't merge in all the other list items into one line. Yeah. So it's, it's list item where and it's um, uh, other uh, block aware. All this is in our contribution guide too as far as the uh, reflow, the, uh, the reflow um, extension. And the line length, we use the arbitrary line length and all that sort of information. Yeah, so there's my 100 column ruler. And I have those rulers there just to give me a visual cue that, oh, this line's too long. I, I need to reflow it. The first one, your standard 80 character terminal. Yeah, yeah, I have, uh, I have it at 76, 80, uh, 100. And then I also have these beginning on um, columns one through five, so it helps me line up the indentation on the front end for those things that matter. Is that a VS Code feature or is that next? VS Code feature, yeah. It's uh, in your configuration. Um, you can set rulers. Here's my configuration file. There, there it is, editor rulers, and you just specify the column numbers. Yeah, when I started, I started at Microsoft Com with my mentor. He was like, call me day one at 9 o'clock. Hey, are you ready to start? <laughs> and he, got <laughs> it from VS Code and he, uh, he actually got me started on this, and I'm like, wow, this is really slick. You know? I was going to ask because the 100 one was like, it's off screen when you're zoomed in. And I was like, well, they're still going over your lines. It's yeah. so, when you zoomed out, I mean, all those things. So, so where are the settings that actually make it break? And get that oh, um, yeah. So the... The extension itself um, has settings. The reflow markdown preferred line length 100. <laughs> if I remember right, do you have your config in your uh, GitHub repo? I do. So yeah, in my personal GitHub repo, yes, I do. In my personal GitHub repo, um, my GitHub alias is uh, SD Wheeler. Um, it's called Tools by Sean. I have a profile folder. I have a modules folder with all the, my modules. In my profile folder, you'll see this settings JSON file, so you can see how I have it configured. Let's say Sean's got some awesome tools, <laughs> the iceberg. I mean, he's got everything automated. So check out his tools. Uh, okay, so how are we doing on time? We've got 10 minutes. All right, so I've made the change here and um, we did this in the 5.1, and I'm going to go and um, I'm going to um, commit my change. Uh, I staged my change, and now we're going to do um, update uh, proper. Type description. That's my commit message. I'm going to go ahead and commit that. Do you have any specific keywords that you're looking at in the commit message? No. Um, I just reinstalled this laptop, and there's something wrong with Git in uh, Visual Studio Code. Let me do it this way. I've I've done that, um, but Visual Studio Code for whatever reason is not picking that up. Oh, and I've customized my prompt here, as you can see. So I've got I'm using PoshKit. It's telling me the state here. Um, I've got the 
repo name and the branch name. Staging is our default branch. You always want to be working in staging. Uh, uh, excuse me. You always want to be working in. Um, it, no, in a in a um, working branch, and your PR goes to staging. Though next week after conference, when I get back, we're going to rename staging to main. So. Um, Uh, a feature branch, and I think Sean's going to create one that has the, uh, the issue number. Yeah, 8739. So, we can use that 3PM published, like behind the scenes, or some other branch that is required. And we actually, I mean, if it's a critical fix or something like that, we can actually manually, manually push the live as well. Right. So, this is the pattern I use is uh, I create my working branches with my initials. It's easier to sort the list and see my branches from somebody else's. Uh, and then I, it's a, it's issue 8739. That's just my workflow process. Um, so now I have my changes. I'm in a new working branch. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show off about my prompt is I've got this wired up. You can control click the repo name and it opens. That is um, an ANSI escape sequence. So I'm just embedding that in the prompt string. Um, all right, so I'm going to do a um, git commit dash m um, update dash property type description. Um, and then git push origin and then the nice thing since uh, Windows terminal here allows uh, you to control click URLs I could control click that and it'll open the um, the PR for me but I have a uh, new PR Yeah, it's my own function. So part of what my prompt does is every time you hit enter, it updates this variable called last commit, and it puts the, the commit string of the last commit in that variable. And then this creates a new PR and auto fills out my PR um, template. And it adds the uh, information here, so it's fixing issue number 8739. So when this gets merged, it'll auto-close the um, issue. So Mike's going to do a review on his screen. I see that Sean submitted this PR. So I'm going to go to the Files tab and take a look at it. So I can see the changes. And you see they're pretty concise, one reason because of the alignment. Um, but I know for a fact, so he's updated this in version 5.1. And normally I would go take a look at one of the other versions, but I already know that they, it has the same problem. So I'm actually going to review the changes, and I'm going to say request changes. And I'm going to say, um, you know, what fun, uh, where are the other versions? <laughs> And that's going in. That's going in live. So yeah, somebody can see that. Anyway, so, they're getting into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. so, do you swear to send a send an issue to the HR repo? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so this is this is what might happen to you. <laughs> um, we'll we'll make suggestions and we'll use the suggestion feature of you know maybe reword it this way so you can just click the commit button and. Uh, and so on. I promise I'll be kind of. I can get Mike to send me that. <laughs> um, 
So now what I need to do is go and edit those other versions. So I need to open up each version of the file, make the same copy, the same changes in and do all that. But there's this really cool tool. There's a uh, software company called Scooter Software. It has this um, uh, tool called Beyond Compare. And um, how many have used it? Okay. I, I swear by this thing. I love it. And uh, if your company won't pay for it, it's only like 60 bucks. It's worth every penny. Uh, and they don't pay me to say this. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. All right. So I have a, another function I've written um, called uh, BC Sync Beyond Compare Sync. Uh, or sync beyond compare, and I can give it a path to the file of one version, and it knows to compare that to all my other versions. Um, I can't zoom this, unfortunately, but this this is the 5.1 version, and over here I have the 7.0 version. So I just need to go down and find my change, and you'll see that there's a lot of differences here. So there's differences between the commandlet versions from 5.1 to 7.0 and so on. Um, we only need to sync the thing that changed that's common to the version. Um, and that's this right here for property type. And you can just click this arrow and it copies it over to the other side. So I'll save that, close it. And now it's comparing 5.1 to 7.1. So I've done the 7.0, now I need to do the 7.1. Boom. Oh, there. Copy this change. And the last one, 7.3. And now I just need to git add minus a, git commit dash m, editorial changes to sync versions, git push origin, and now my PR should be updated, and you'll see the build is kicking off again. So while we're waiting on that, one thing I want to tell you, I'm, so I'm going to give you the answer. So I'm going to give, give you the cheat sheet. You don't take anything out of this, and you want to contribute to docs. There's a PowerShell docs style guide, and if you scroll through this, this is exactly what we look for when we review your PR. Without having to read anything else, it, it tells you all the little details. And it's not very long. It's not very much to read either because we've got 50,000 different contribution guides. So if you want to know something about unordered list or anything like that, it's all in this one doc. And that's, um, yeah, we're out of time. We don't need to show the merger. Um, you guys understand that. I, I do want to show, um, whoops. More about what's in it for you guys uh, contributing out here in a, the community section of our documentation. Um, this is where we have our contributors guide that has that checklist, but also we have um, this what's new in docs. I update this every month uh, with links to the new articles or major changes we've made. Um, and we list community contributors who've submitted PRs that we've merged. And if you do enough, you can end up in the uh, Contributor Hall of Fame. Um, and so this is for the history of the repo going back to 2015 when it open sourced. And um, the folks who have contributed the most pull requests and the most GitHub issues. So, and what's that value? you? Hey, you can sign it with your social media and blog site. The reason I used to write for the Hey Scripting Guy and the PowerShell Magazine and all the different ones, because I wanted to drive traffic to my site because Microsoft gets a lot more traffic. So that's the reason I write a blog on the community site. 
And I know that PowerShell.org, they'll take a contribution as well. One last thing. Put in a plug for the PowerShell community blog. This is a blog that we have opened to the community to do, to, to, to submit posts. Uh, and the process for doing that is through this GitHub repo. And so the editing process is uh, all the same. And, and we can help you with that, uh, help you with your writing and do that editorial review before it gets posted. So if you've ever thought about starting a blog, but you don't want to have to worry about which blogging platform, whatever, you can get your feet wet here. So we just kind of post to the... Yeah. So, and I want to follow up on Andrew's question real quick. So if you want to reach out to us, I mean, it's just something generic, then just log a GitHub issue. But if you have some specific questions about something, I mean, we want to be very involved with the community. Yep. And use our email. Just send us an email. And I'm somebody that I like to respond to all this stuff, you know. <laughs> so uh, nothing goes. But uh, also, do we have any questions? I think we're over our time. We are. We can take this to the hall. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you.